I'm Penny Markey. I'm coordinator of youth services for the County of Los Angeles Public Library. And uh, I wanted to share with you, um, Judy said, share your wisdom. Um, the, count, the county library uh, is on the ELF advisory board because of our historical work with children and parents and families. We've been doing it for a very long time and I want to tell you it takes a very long time. I want to give you a little bit of the history and the dribs and drabs that we have done through the years and where we are now. But the thing, again, I was the one who said time and patience in terms of partnership. It takes time and patience to make these things work. And the reason why I said I'd go first is I wanted to be the example. Because we started in the early uh, 1990, about 1990 actually, with our first baby project, which was begin at the beginning with books, which was the forerunner to the American Library Association Born to Read project. And that was a program that was a partnership between um, our Department of Health Services of the county and our, our pre pregnancy clinics and the public library that took place in uh, waiting rooms, reading to children and talking to parents. So we started back that far with that project, which kind of went away. It was a limited scope of the project in a very few sites. But at the same time, we began to understand the importance of working with parents in order to have them be their parents' first teacher. So about the time that PLA started its initiatives, we didn't, that didn't fit with us. That didn't fit us very well. We looked for something that we could be comfortable with, so we started our own initiative at that point where we were focusing on the parents of young children, and as they came to our regular story times, we gave them tools to take home with them. We gave the story time to the kids, but we also talked over the heads of the children to talk to the parents and encourage them to share some of the things that we were sharing in story time at home. Well, that grew, and as time went by, the County of Los Angeles had a goal, which was to improve the lives of children and families in Los Angeles County. The public library what came on as a partner in that initiative because, obviously, we had something to share with the children and families in our community. And we were working with health services, we were working with social services, we were working with parks and recreation, all of us to sit at the table and try and figure out what we could do for families in Los Angeles County. Uh, out of that initiative came something that was called partnering principles and the county as a whole was going to work towards helping families to help themselves rather than giving them money or giving them what they should do with their children, they were going to try a pro they were going to try and promote the idea of giving parents the skills that they needed to help themselves and their families. And each of the departments had to try and figure out something. And I was in a tizzy. It was like, we do this. That's what we do all the time. That's what the public library does. We give people tools. And somebody sat me down and said, stop talking about it and do something and show us what you can do and show us your stuff. And that's when we found the Family Place Program. This was about three or four years ago, and we discovered the Family Place Program and explored it, and discovered that what that program could do for us was to allow us to to change our atmosphere in the library to make it more family friendly all around, and it could, through the workshops, bring parents together where they could be hands-on with their kids learning for themselves and in addition provide them with a network of other parents that they could connect to and learn from. That program started for us three years ago at six sites. We, had, we got grant funding. $25,000 a site was what it cost us and we got grant funding for six sites. That program, three and a half years ago, made such an enormous change, cultural change in our organization that we went out and found more grant funding, and pretty soon we had 13 sites. Then we went out and found more grant funding. Last year there were 19 sites. This year, by the end of the year, there will be 25 sites. And what we have done in those sites and continue to do 
is to develop child-friendly places. We bring together all of our resources for parents and children into one site. We now have toys, developmental toys. Um, that's, that's what it's like to walk into our library every day. We have trained our staff. These children and families are important to us. They, we, we are friendly to them. We support them. We work with them. We had people, and you're going to find your staff is going to say to you, we don't run daycare centers. Why are you bringing these families and children in? We worked with that staff. We worked with them to help them understand that what we were doing was engaging children and engaging families. And you know what? We're going to have 25 sites this year. I have libraries who have watched the development of this program who are clamoring to be next on my list to go and find money for them. So that's what we're doing. Our partners, again, we started with the county. We started big. I can contact my social service agencies and say, we need help. We need speakers in this part of the county. Please, can you help us out? Our parks and recreation provide play therapists. We work closely with WIC to provide nutritionists to come in and do our programs. Uh, we work with our child care, the county child care people, and they're going to be sending somebody into some of our programs to talk to the parents about how they can choose, um, you know, good child care providers. So, but none of this happened in a day. None of it happened in a day, and even before the county did its thing, we were on the lookout to see who in our neighborhoods could work with us and what kind of resources could we bring in to work with them. And I do want to make the offer. Uh, we, I've had experience. We've done it. We've run into all the problems, and we'll still run into more. But I'm always glad to be a resource person for you because this has been such a cultural changing activity that I've seen happen within the county library that take little steps. You don't, you're not going to do it all at once. Take little steps. Make one partner. We, some of our libraries, we, we promised that we would do best practices in the libraries that don't have family place areas. So we have toy collections that we send out to our other libraries to have play days, toy days in our other libraries so that parents, even if they're not a formal family place library with the money attached, can bring kids in to do um, play days. They're looking at the resources we bring in in our communities, and they're building little, little focus groups within their own communities, even if they don't have the money to go with it. So it is possible. We have a wonderful model that we're using internally, and we can be for you, too. So I'm open for questions when the time comes. Can I do my five minutes? <laughs> well, my name is Heather Tovey, and this is Carrie Gross. We're from Butte County Library up in the northern region of the state, above Sacramento. And we were a bit overwhelmed this time last year. We were sitting where you are. And we were just overwhelmed by all the possibilities and also very excited. We hadn't even worked together yet. She, Carrie is with the literacy department, and I work in children's services. So we hadn't spend, spent much time at all together. Um, we can't resist showing you a few pictures of what we did because we did go back and get some great things happening in our area. So let me show you those while Carrie tells you about it. Heather's going to show you a slide and it shows some of the things that we did within the library branches. We focused on two branches and our aim was to make it more family friendly and some of the things that we did were to develop the collection further for babies and for their parents and to provide the materials right in the children's room to make them easily accessible. And then another thing was to um, was to introduce the wall panels and you all have been talking a good bit about this but it was so much fun to see these small introductions into the different library branches that could really make a difference just even at the get-go when you walk in. Do we have and Not technically real savvy. Um, as far as programming we introduced our library playtimes, we call them, and it's modeled after the family place that you all have been hearing so many good things about. We got involved with our 
referral and res or resource and referral agency locally, and they were wonderful about providing toys and things along those lines for the programs. And we invited the resource specialists, just as they've been, been talking about. Okay, there you can see. There you go. Yay! <laughs> Little baby Claire at the bottom, and our books at the top here that are in the children's room, and the hobnobs as you leave the, the area by the circulation desk. We let the um, circulation staff vote on which ones they wanted. We included them in the, on that process, and they got really excited. We had the pictures up there at the circ desk, and they were just thr thrilled with that. And they love it because the children are entertained while they're doing library business with the adults. So that they really love it. Um, these are the lap sits, and Heather's been key in this, and you can see them. Her real aim is not to be the entertainer for the little event, but to really facilitate that parent-child relationship, and she's so wonderful at it. And you can see the, the kids all engaged. Here is the library playtime, um, and it's much like, what, much like you've seen, but just kind of a Butte County look about it. Um, so we did, a, we did kind of introductory series of the lap sits and the playtimes our first year. They were all very well received by the, by the community. People were really interested in either supporting them or coming on out about them. And Heather's going to talk about some of the highlights that we saw this first year. Well, and I'm not sure did you cover our connection. We have made a um, connection with our local resource and referral agency and they're the ones that they bring their toy lending van. Um, and they bring the toys and the expertise with them. The child development component comes with the, the driver of the van. And um, so they bring the toys and they help set it up and um, it's just been a great um, collaboration between our two agencies and it makes a lot of sense. So, and we've, we've reached out to other agencies too through our, um, our guests that come into our playtimes, um, Chico State and their hearing and language department and their free um, screenings that they do there. We've made that available, they've made that available to some of the um, parents. But what else am I missing here? Carrie will tell you how we, sustainability was a huge issue. As you know, you get something started, you want to maintain it. You don't want to get everyone excited about it and then boom, it's gone. So um, Carrie had a fabulous idea with that and we pursued it. So I'll let her tell you about it. And I think even before we get to the sustainability, some of the things that we did to work with the library staff, after we got back from Sacramento last year, we met and we went home and met with some of the branch librarians that were going to be involved as well as the staff who was going to be providing the services and we really started talking about what this was going to look like and that's not something that happens all the time in our library jurisdiction so just that we were at the same table at the same time was kind of an event for us. Um. <laughs> We were talking it up in the individual branches as well about what was going on. And then Heather and I went to the different branches to their staff meetings and we talked about ELF and what it looked like so that everybody could get an idea of what the philosophy was and what things we were aiming towards. And writing it up in monthly activities reports and just really trying to get the word out. And generate the excitement and a lot of the staff were just really getting on board yep. and it was a woman in one of our circulation departments that actually did the flyer and that wasn't something anybody had asked her to do before and it was beautiful so kind of those little things one of the other branch librarians was key in making the selection for the material so people were supporting us from all different directions and so it felt like we were part of a bigger effort within the library rather than just the two of us yeah. trying to figure this out and sir, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. After you, after you. Um, in terms of sustainability, one of the branch librarians said at that first meeting at the table, I don't want to have anything to do with this if this is going to be one of those fly-by-night things that comes and goes. So, And we understood that. We didn't want to see that happen either. But from the get-go, we were thinking sustainability. We were fortunate just by the nature of ELF that it did draw so much attraction from the media and from key supporters in that sense. Um, we went by our first five depart um first five office and just shared a bit wh about what was going on that we were really excited about it and we made some other visits and had people come by we were fortunate that one of the branch librarians who was at that initial meeting was at a later meeting with 
the, one of the Board of Supervisors who turned out to be one of the commissioners on First Five. And so they just had this happen chance meeting and because she'd been talking with us, the branch librarian could talk with the Board of Supervisor representative about what was going on. So that was a, a really exciting part. But in terms of First Five, I don't know how it is in all of your areas, but for us it's three year cycles that the, the grants are for three years. And we'd been through the cycle, the literacy program had been through the cycle a few years ago and had funding, but we weren't current grantees. And it seemed like it made so much sense for us to reach out to this component for funding, but it was an intense process. And I don't know for all of you, but it's really an intense kind of an undertaking. But we went through the process and they were eliminating people. We were up with the County Office of Ed and the medical community and things. People love ELF and they really were excited to support us. Even through that grueling experience, I felt like people were rooting yeah, for us were. and wanting to see us succeed in applying for this funding. And we've been fortunate, we'll be funded through 2010 and it will help to support ELF, but it's also going to help with our Families for Literacy program and reaching out to adult learners, those who are parents with small children. And so we're really excited to see that effort be supportive too and we've probably taken our time I imagine <laughs> so we'll be quiet but just we're really excited and if you're out there thinking that it's overwhelming we were starting from ground zero and so many positive things happened a lot of things so we'll, we'll answer questions but we'll share <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, I'm Nancy Wood. I work for an independent library district in California. In other words, it isn't associated with a city. It is not associated with a county. It is not associated with a university. There are actually 12 independent library districts in the state of California, and two of them are next door neighbors. Beaumont is the library I work for, and Banning, which they're about 50, 60 miles east of here, they, Banning just became an independent library district this year. So it's interesting, uh, an independent library district has a lot of, um, a lot of uh, leeway to do and focus on what they want to do and focus on. And um, in 2001, the library had had difficulty finding a, an adult literacy person to carry on their program. So because of the first five commissions, they decided to try some early literacy uh, work at the library. And they looked for a librarian that had some early childhood experience and none of you were there. I don't know why not. But um, I, my background is actually education. I've worked in uh, public schools as a substitute teacher for a lot of years and I worked in early childhood education. I'd worked in Head Start for 10 and a half years as a teacher and an education specialist training teachers to teach. And so I needed to make a, a change in um, location and this, you know, this came up on the website and I applied and so I changed careers. I became a librarian to implement their, they, did, they, they wrote a grant to First Five for, a, for planning and so it was like here's the planning grant, spend the money, you know, make sure you do your outcomes, make sure you do your assessments, because it's pretty involved. You have to report, you have to report that you've made a difference. You really do. And that's one thing. If you, if you go with some other funders, please, please, please do what John says. Pre-assess and post-assess. And really think about what change in behavior or change in attitude or change in opinion the people that come to your library can accomplish. Because it's great to have wonderful programs, because we, we know we always have great programs. But really, we want to put something there that will, will make a difference. And that's a real key issue. And I took several months, in fact, I took nine months before I implemented any program. I went, I found Family Place like a good librarian and I had no idea, you know, I wasn't a librarian by profession. I researched to find out what was going on in public libraries and I found Family Place back in 2002 and I went to the training. I didn't actually implement anything. That was November of 2002. I didn't implement until September of 2003. 
So I did a lot of groundwork. Now, some of you, um, I think you don't have that much time. But you do have a few months to do, to look at your communities. And I know we do this a lot. We say, well, we know our communities. Well, you do. That's true. But you need to find out what other people know about your community. That's the real key. And when you start doing your community scans and when you start talking to your key people, you find out some things that they know that you didn't know. And you tell them some things that you know that they didn't know. And that's very, very important. Very important. So long story short, you're doing some great things already. But you have to know why you're doing them. That's a real key issue. Why are you doing these great things? And going out to your community, finding out really what that community wants, then you're going to find out why you're doing what you're doing. And then you can prove that you've made a difference. Um, I have an interesting situation because through these last four years, um, I have so many people that want to come to my programs that we had to apply for a community development block grant to put in an elevator to the unused second floor for the past 16 years so that people, so that we could use the upstairs for my programs. Um, supposedly, they're supposed to start on the elevator next week, supposedly. <laughs> of course, we've been hearing this for the past six months, but, um, you just you just never know. It's a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, and many of you, many of you are doing lots of the elements of developmentally appropriate practice, lots of the elements of family place, you know, your play times, your your uh, programs with babies. You know, it's just really looking at it from a different perspective. It really is. You look at it from a little different perspective and you tweak a few things. And it, it makes a difference in the way you approach your community, the way you approach your stakeholders, the way you approach your staff in your library, just as Heather and, and Carrie were saying, and Penny as well. So that's my little pitch. So we'll go on to San Francisco here. So just in case you haven't seen enough pictures of me and my library, I have a couple of more. I had no idea. <laughs> This is going to happen. So I'm Christy Estrovitz. I'm the Early Literacy Specialist for the San Francisco Public Library. I have some notes. And you all have some of our goodies that we've developed in association to our Early Literacy Initiative. So here's a picture of one of our great story times at our mission library. It's a bilingual story time. Lots of happy faces. Um, a couple of years ago, the library decided to earmark some funds for early literacy. So we're actually not part of the LSTA grant, but we're on the advisory committee because we are an ELF library. We're doing early learning. So thank you, city librarian, <laughs> for this. Um, our directive is to serve as a primary resource and support for parents and caregivers in the development of early literacy in the city's children. So that's our mission statement. With this program, it's providing lots and lots of new books. So this is um, kind of a total for the, the running total for support for this program, not this year's funding. So we put new books into our collection. All of the books that are on our beautiful book list are available in the libraries. They're available in many languages when we can find them. And also multiple copies, too. We also have support material or funding for printing these beautiful materials. So just to let you know, the first three that we did were Babies, Toddlers, Preschooler, Full Color Bleeds. Uh, we worked with the publishers to get permission to use their images. It was very, very easy to do. It took a conversation and signing on the dotted line. We didn't have to sign over our firstborn or anything like that. So <laughs> feel free to ask. It's free publicity for the publishers. We also decided to upgrade our, our book list and include early literacy tips that are appropriate for the babies, toddlers, and preschoolers. So we wanted something fun. And also, these are available in many of the CDCs that we work with and community partners. So when I go into First Five, this is the first thing I see. We have these by the thousands, so we are very generous in giving these out. Um, we also, let's see, oh, support materials. These are basic early li literacy materials for the story time environment. We really wanted to support our children's librarians, all 45 of them, and the programs, the wonderful programs that they're doing. So we devised a basic early literacy kit 
So with an option to customize for their library, so a, a basic easel, a beautiful easel, flannel board on one side, dry erase on the other side. Beautiful magnetic letters, which many of you have seen in the photos, five inch letters from Lakeshore. Numbers, um, a doll to demonstrate how to adapt the itsy bitsy spider for the baby and the toddler and the preschooler. Um, probably some other things, a boom box because we want to use music, musical instruments, so bells and shakers. So we're, that's an ongoing um, project of ours is to provide the materials that we need or our, our staff need. Also professional development for training of our staff and also early childhood community. So we not only offer Mother Goose for our staff, but we try to offer it to our child care providers too by offering free workshops. And we also give a certificate of professional development um, so we verify their time and the topic of the, the um, workshop. And of course, my job, thanks. Um, so resources, uh, what's new at the library? More resources, more books, um, enhanced story times. So all of our story times have an early literacy component to it, not only in the action, but also the words that we're using. So explaining why we're doing the programs, very simple message. Um, educator workshops and community partnerships. So I'm breezing through this. Um, we've also developed a kindergarten resource list too, so check that out. Um, our enhanced story times, have you seen these pictures before? Um, but we've taken the philosophy that the, as um, written by Renee Arnold from Multnomah County, the child is the first teacher and the librarian is the parent's first literacy coach. So we put this into action in every story time that we offer. More information, just in the past year, we offered over 2,000 programs for ages 0 to 5. I would say close to 1,000 of those programs for, were for the youngest child, so babies. Um, we had over 71,000 participants, too. Um, professional development, we put 37 hours of professional development for our staff. So this was Mother Goose on the Loose, this is music and literacy program, this is Saroj coming to spend a couple of days with us. Initially with the concept of our Every Child Ready to Read program, Saroj spoke to our branch managers for three, three hours saying this is what's happening in early literacy, this is the research, this is what your programs are going to start to look like. That's how we got the buy-in for the time to come to a full day workshop or a half day workshop. And then she spent a day with our staff doing the intensive Every Child Ready to Read training um, and also has come back to teach us how to do workshops in the community too. And a refresher course for our new children's librarians that we're getting. Uh, we also had a, a literacy breakfast with Rosemary Wells too, that was in the previous slide. Here are some of our educator workshops. We've had, a, that is a live snake at the workshop. Um, this is Tree Frog Treks, a local science agency. They do a lot of work with the Head Starts and CDCs, so we invited them to come in and train people that maybe aren't involved with Head Starts or CDCs, so the family daycare providers. That's probably one of our largest audience that are coming to the professional development workshops that we're offering at the library, and another music and literacy. And we're also taking basic workshops of best practices for reading aloud, sharing rhymes and songs to the CDCs. So spending a couple of hours there sharing our favorite books, materials, and best of all, having the opportunity to chat with them what's needed. Are you being serviced by the bookmobile? Have you met your children's librarian? Oh, here's her contact. Here's his contact. This is what they're offering. So making that connection. Um, here are a list of some of our partners. Partnerships, they are some of our best resources outside of our staff. These are the folks that become ambassadors for the library. These are the folks that have our book list and freely give them out at community events. Um, these are the folks that reach the new customers that bring in, them into the library. So we are grateful for these partnerships. They also cross promote, um, actually they promote our professional development workshops. So raising a reader when they go out to their 150 sites, they're also giving a flyer of our latest workshop. First five is having our workshops posted on their website as an opportunity for professional development. Uh, we're working with the San Francisco Unified School District. They have an amazing team of uh, CDC site managers, so we're part of their professional development training. We're offering four workshops for their staff at their sites. Um, we've got a, a CCRNR, that's the Wuyi Children's Services that we're working with too. Um, we're connect, conducting a workshop in Cantonese for their family child care providers at one of our sites. Just an example. Um, oh, what's also interesting this year in particular, because I work so closely with Raising a Reader and Jumpstart, 
Um, these organizations have been invited to present at the Head Start training, their grand mass training at the beginning of the year. Well, they said, oh, let's, can we invite the library? And they're like, of course, of course. So we did joint presentations of literacy, and it was so much fun. And I had been on the um, agenda for the school district, so I was like, can I invite Raising a Reader? I know they're in most of your sites. Easy. They're like, please, 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 come. So that was an easy way for us to open the door for another organization, to have 15 minutes to share what we're doing. And my secret weapon are goodie bags. <laughs> so when I go to do a presentation for Head Start, or for um, any organization, I make a goodie bag. I go to Smart and Final. I get the small little grocery bags. I make sure that they fit our wide kindergarten book list because it's a little bit larger than this. I put an um, Avery label on it that says, Every Child Ready to Read Goodies from the San Francisco Public Library. Really simple. I have my staff help me with this, and I give them something. It's a gift from the library. I might stuff it with the list of children's librarians with their email addresses, their... Um, their telephone numbers. I might, you know, if Raising a Reader has reading tips, I put that in there too. Very, very easy and super effective. <laughs> so, oh, here we also work with teen moms at one of the local high schools too. So this is a picture of a mom and her toddler reading together. Oh, partnerships in action. Here's a blue bag bonanza happening at our mission library. Um, this happened with Raising a Reader. How many of you are involved with Raising a Reader in some capacity? Oh, a few hands. Great, great. Well, there. Um, this is a book bag program, and it was time for all the families to get their personal blue bag. So Raising a Reader met the families at their CDC, talked about reading aloud, the importance of their blue bag. The moms and their dads and their kids with their blue bags walked down the street just one block to the Mission Library for a fabulous story time. It was in English and in Spanish. The moms and dads were chanting along. They were singing along. It was fabulous. We're talking about the library. Kids got their first library card. Parents got their first library cards. And the best part of it, they stayed after. They stayed after and they decorated their bags with puffy paint and tried to put buttons on their bags and feathers. Feathers don't really work so well. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but it was a great family program. And for a lot of these families, it was their first time at the library. So do you think they've been back? Of course they've been back. And every bag that I saw was filled with books. So talk about a meaningful experience with not a lot of work on Raising a Reader's End, not a lot of work on the CDC end, and definitely not a lot of work on the library's end. So try it. It's great. Um, as you've seen, the, the uh, first annual literacy storybook performance at the Bayview Opera House, this was a partnership program with Jumpstart's Early Literacy Initiative with first five family ambassadors raising a reader, the public library, and in between the skits, each of the partners stood up and did something. They talked a little bit about their organization. I read, if you're happy and you know it, the pop-up book by David Carter, so everyone's singing and dancing. And, and it was just an opportunity to promote our services and say, hey, we support literacy in this community. Oh, what's next for us? Um, we're kind of on a roll here. We're super excited about early literacy. We're developing our spaces now. We've trained our staff. We're working with um, partnerships. That's kind of, that's in motion. Um, to keep up the momentum, we're exploring early learning spaces. So these are some of the Burgeon Group products. You might have seen them at Phoenix Public Library in Apache Junction. They're fine end panels that you can put on basically the end of any end panels, and they have numerous, just endless open-ended ideas for play. So, and this is a cute little book box down in the corner for board books, so kids can sort and play and um, interact at the library. So, okay, more pictures of the library. Had to show them. Um, so I, I just wanted to s share with you what's happening at the San Francisco Public Library. We also did an early um, a story time survey. If you want to know more about that, ask me, because now it's Janice's turn. So thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Janice O'Driscoll. I'm coordinator of youth services for the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Uh, Santa Cruz County is a small county, uh, has a lot of different things happening in one small space. We have a very large farm worker population, and many of those people live right next door to movers and shakers who work in Silicon Valley. 
We have a good number of working families. Uh, we have 10 branches and a bookmobile, which is a lot for a small county, but we make it work. We, uh, like many of the other libraries, have started training our staff with Every Child Ready to Read principles. We were introduced to them at a regional workshop, and then the, our friends of the library enabled us to bring Saroj back to Santa Cruz for two days to train um, the entire staff. And so this was staff. Um, doing the story times, the lap times, and the baby rhyme times, all the programs. And that is when we began to see a shift, a shift in working with parents and caregivers as partners. Right about that time in 2000, uh, first five Santa Cruz counties started uh, making money available to uh, people in the community. We looked around and we saw that there was support for child care centers and preschools. Uh, there was not very much for family care providers, those valiant people who work in their homes. They start at 6 o'clock in the morning, perhaps when the first child is delivered, and they might be still there at 6 or 7 at night, their own family still waiting for them. It's an isolating kind of life. Um, you're having this wonderful influence on children, but you are there in your homes. And the seatbelt laws, as wonderful and as important as they are, brought further isolation to these people because you have to have a pretty large vehicle to accommodate car seats in booster seats and all the different kinds of things. You need a Hummer or a van or something. <laughs> so people who actually were getting their kids into some kind of vehicle and getting to the library to story times are no longer able to do that. So we decided that was the group that we wanted to focus on. And we developed a program called Read to Me. Read to Me is a program where we we have created 450 kits. They're canvas bags about this big, about this tall. They have 10 to 12 books in them. They have audio, CDs, posters, and these posters are very simple. We took calendars apart and laminated them, but posters that look colorful in the home. We have puppets and we act, have activity uh, suggestions. And then what we do, believe it or not, is someone from the library goes out to the provider once a month with a kit. They do a story time or an activity in the provider's home. The provider gets a chance to talk to somebody, and we leave the kit for a month. Then we return the next month with another kit. We uh, strive for consistency so that the children and the providers get to know the one library staff person. So that, that person represents the library. And I can talk later about how we make it possible to break away the staff. Um, when we began in 2000, Read to Me was fully funded by First Five. We knew that eventually this funding would go down. And uh, as several people have said, we look at grant money as seed money. And we try not to take something on that we think in some way we cannot sustain afterward. So as the funding has gone down for First Five, we have been able to take over more and more of it. We still have um, a little piece of Read to Me that is funded by First Five um, that actually pays for sub money so that the library staff people can go out and do the visits and still be able to prepare. It's not very much money, but um, it makes all the difference in the world for this program. So this program has been going for seven years. I can hardly believe that I'm saying that, but it's true. The kind of partnerships that we built there that I want to talk about, I want to give you some specific examples. We um, worked with the Child Development Resource Center when we first started 
the kids we wanted. We told them we wanted to work with family care providers, and they started working with us about the things that we need to know what we, we the way we needed to translate what we knew from working in a public library to going out um, and working with providers and, and certainly working in the home. We also did workshops for them. We had social workers come in to train the staff about doing home visits. It is no small thing to go into another person's home. And as, as well-intentioned as you are, and there's a lot of things you need to think about, and so they provided that kind of training for us. We are now at the point where our uh, uh, Child Development Resource Center sends out our Read to Me uh, newsletter in their mailings. They invite us to present at their trainings and their workshops where the library presents. And it has taken seven years to get to that point, but it's a wonderful back and forth relationship. We have added another wonderful piece, uh, Family Place. We are just we are just in the begin well not really beginnings we're sort of in the kind of beginnings of family place because we have two libraries that we have done um, parent workshop series with uh, we have three more branches that we're going to do them with and we have plans for another year we have had five people train go through the family place uh, training. And this is another place where you connect with the community. And I'll give you some examples of what we do with uh, the community. With the people at WIC, we leave a deposit collection in their waiting room. So when the moms come in with their children, there are books there. And whatever happens to those books happens. You know, we have assured them, do not worry about this. We know what we're doing. And if they're gone, they're gone, and we hope somebody is enjoying them. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we do is quarterly, we offer a nutrition story time. And you guys do this all the time anyway. You have food story times. Well, what we do is we arrange with WIC because mothers who participate in this program have to have nutrition education credits to get their vouchers. So our nutrition story times count as nutrition credits. So they just come very uh, quietly at the end. We sign the paper, and then that counts toward their vouchers. That's a very simple arrangement any of you could make, uh, that kind of thing. We, we just have uh, connected with a wonderful person at the University of California at Santa Cruz who is doing research in um, early child development, very early child development. And so we had her come in as one of our resource specialists, and it turns out that she has an eight-month-old baby. So she came with her baby, and she had instant credibility. All right, yeah, we know you're teaching of a UCSC, but we know you're dealing with this kid. Um, we've just wonderful things. I have just a few days ago uh, made a connection with Easter Seals, and I really encourage you to connect with Easter Seals. And the reason that we connected with them was because we are concerned, as I bet you are too, you're seeing more and more autistic children coming into the library wanting to participate in the programs, and it's a challenge to figure out how to do that. It turned out that um, these children can be diagnosed pretty young, as young as six months now, and interventions can be made not drug-related that are play therapy-related. So whammo, we're just like magnets. So I really encourage you to connect with them because they have a training program in this area. And it's, their regions are very large. They, our region includes 10 counties, but I encourage you to get a hold of them.